All right. Um, MSI guy and MSI gal went on a, a field trip today. And uh, let me show you where we went. Uh, this is the San Francisco Bay. And San Francisco is, is up here. And if you go down the peninsula, you can see there's the ocean over here, Pacific Ocean, and then the San Francisco Bay. If you go down the bay, you end up here in a town called Palo Alto. And uh, Palo Alto has Stanford University. And so this is Stanford University here in the middle of the screen. And uh, if you've ever been to Stanford, uh, this is the Oval. Um, Stanford football games are over there. So attached to Stanford is something called Slack. Uh, it originally stood for the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Um, but since it was being paid for by a bunch of government money, they didn't like the name Stanford stuck on it. Um, and so um, it was the largest program ever funded by the government uh, back in the day. And uh, yet yeah, it's now called the National Accelerator Laboratory. All right. So uh, this is where we went today. So this is a, a, a Google Maps. And you can see this line that goes horizontally across the screen there. And that line is the accelerator. So what is an accelerator? Well, you generate electrons and you're going to generate electrons down over here. And you, you make those electrons with an electron gun. And then you put them into a tube. And this tube has magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields accelerate the uh, electron. And there's a, there's a tube about... Um, I would say three quarters of an inch in diameter, the hole in, in the tube. The entire tube is about three inches, solid copper. And the electrons fire down the center of this tube. I'll show it to you later. But they go down and they get accelerated faster and faster and faster as we go along the accelerator here. It's two miles long. So the electron has two miles to speed up and it gets going fast and fast and fast and fast and it goes really, really fast. And it keeps it going, it gets faster and faster and faster. It actually goes underneath the freeway. This is Highway 280 if you've ever been uh, uh, in California. But it keeps going faster and faster and faster until it finally gets to its final velocity here. And then uh, this beam of electrons can be diverted and so you can see, this is kind of like a, rail, a railroad switching yard. You can use magnets to switch the electron beam to go south or to go north or to go straight ahead. Um, some things were added later to put them in a ring, and you could, like, store them here and spin them around in a ring. It doesn't show good on an aerial map. There's actually a bigger ring that zips around here, too. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And um, Stanford uh, was quite the place. So the accelerator was built in around 1962, and during its lifetime, it actually did a lot of good science. Um, it produced three Nobel Prizes. Um, it found the charm quark, and it found the quark structure inside of protons and neutrons, and it found the tau lepton, which is kind of a weird electron. Um, and interestingly, maybe for you guys, the Homebrew Computer Club in the 1970s and 80s met at Slack facilities, which is kind of interesting. Here's a great picture uh, showing, and this is an early photograph, so there's not, not a lot of other things around, so you can see more clearly what the original thing looked like. Um, you can see that it was, uh, the electrons started in the far distance there, and then they shot forward, and they went into these different uh, experimental uh, areas. All right, uh, here is a section of the accelerator, um, and it is a whole bunch of copper washers and spacers. And like I said, it's about three inches in diameter, and um, it has cooling, uh, uh, water cooling uh, on the sides of it, so it has those copper tubes to cool the thing down. And uh, you need to be able to import energy into the system to keep it accelerating. So how do you push these electrons? You think, well, maybe they use magnets or something like that. What they actually use is microwaves. And above this tube here in the background, you can sort of see some rectangular waveguides coming from down from above. And that waveguide comes down, and then it gets bent and goes left, and also then... 
uh, goes around. Anything that's reflected, uh, you can sort of think of that little junction there as a coupler. Anything that got separated and came back went into that gray-looking thing that pointed off to the right. And that's actually a a load. And I talked about this before. It's a tapered load, so it kills any stray reflections and acts as a, as a 50 ohm resistor, basically. But it's a trap. It's an RF trap. Here's another picture of the device, a little more difficult, but you can see some of the microwave uh, waveguides, these rectangular waveguides, and uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of these things. Um, here's a great picture of the waveguide sort of coming from the back and bending around and coming in to that sign there that says rectangular waveguide, and, and then it goes into that accelerating tube, that tube with the... Um, heat sinking tubes on the outside. The microwave energy kind of goes through that at a right angle and it sets up a wave. And it's almost like a, a, a standing wave that they set up in this thing that causes the particles to accelerate. The, the electrons are kind of like riding on a, on a wave, kind of surfing this wave and they get accelerated. So, so how do you generate um, these microwaves? This red thing in the center is a klystron tube. It is a 35 megawatt klystron tube, and they have 240 of them <laughs> spread out along the two mile section. So it's a lot of energy. I asked um, them about this, and they said, Well, what we can tell you is that their electricity bill every month is a million dollars. So million dollars a month in just electricity to run these klystrons. And as you look down the hall there, you can see klystron, 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 and that, that hallway goes for two miles. Um, the klystrons sit about 30 feet over the accelerator tube. So the accelerator tube is actually 30 feet below the surface. We're sort of on the surface here where the klystron tubes are, but that they get piped down with waveguides down below us, and uh, that's where the electrons are generated. These things are pretty big. They're, they're, they're probably the size of a person, the, the tube, the klystron tube. Yeah, they're, they're pretty big. Maybe a, a big person, like a 250-pound person. All right, so it sort of lasted as long as it could. The big accelerators like in CERN and places um, are just way bigger than this could ever be. And so they were looking for some other interesting thing to do with what they had. And uh, even though the scientists at Slack still do lots of experiments at CERN and other places and help them out with sensors and imaging and stuff, um, they're not doing hardcore particle physics at Slack any longer. But what somebody did was quite clever, and it's now a real showcase. Um, they created something called a um, free electron X-ray laser. And what they do is they take the accelerator that they already have. So what's shown here, the, the electron gun and the accelerator, that's all existing stuff at Slack. They, they built something called an undulator. And an undulator is a whole bunch of magnets, a whole bunch of like north-south, north-south, north-south. So as the electrons go shooting into that undulator, they see these changing magnetic fields in it, and it wiggles, it wiggles the electrons, it undulates them. And when, when um, electrons change path, they emit... Uh, X-rays. You can look up something called uh, a synchro synchrotron uh, radiation, and uh, these X-rays then are generated by this undulator. And now you have a mixture of electrons and X-rays all traveling together. Uh, here's something else I found on the undulator. It's just like I said, north-south, and they, it wiggles the uh, wiggles the path of the electrons and and uh, produces uh, X-rays. So this is a great picture. So you have the linear accelerator 
and then you create these bunches of electrons. It's pulsed. You get these pulses of, of packets of electron pulses. They're, they're, they're one femtosecond wide, very narrow pulses. And these pulses then are a bunch of electrons and, and these x-rays, and they're all kind of grouped together. And you can send them through a secondary magnet system, which is the wiggler. And the wiggler is kind of like an undulator in a different direction. And what it does is it creates um, a periodic wave front. So the electrons kind of align themselves to these magnets and create wave fronts. And these wave fronts start traveling in a coherent fashion. And uh, they line up with the elect with the uh, uh, X rays, and so now you have basically this packet of of, of information that is coherent, and you know, these perfectly coherent wave fronts that are running. But unfortunately, you've got both electrons and and X rays together, so you run them into a secondary magnet that just strips off all the electrons. The electrons go flying off to the left, and everything else goes straight. And so you, now you've created these X-rays that are coherent. So they're lasers. So it's an X-ray laser, coherent X-ray pulses. And so what can you do with something like a coherent X-ray pulse? Well, you can kind of go back to the really old days of and think about X-ray crystallography, where you shine X-rays on crystalline materials that are periodic, and then they scatter in predictable ways. So if this is a test pattern and you shine X-rays on these things, and then you take a look at their diffraction patterns, how things scatter off of those. If it's just a point, it'll create kind of uh, circles, kind of a target. Uh, if it's a periodic pattern, it'll create vertical lines. Or if it's a pattern in the other direction, it'll be horizontal lines. If it's a group of things like, like a hexagonal ring, you'll get a particular group. So you can use this to try to understand the atomic structure of materials. You know, if you put benzene in here, you'll get a hexagonal diffraction pattern off of it. If you put different types of chemicals, you can, you can figure out if they're cubic or hexagonal. You can find out all kinds of things using this crystal uh, X-ray crystallography. Today, um, you can do much more complicated things like DNA. You can actually shine x-rays onto something like DNA and it will create a particular pattern. And of course, that was a Nobel Prize when somebody did this crystallography x-ray thing and said, hey, <laughs> look at that. We get this weird x. And the only thing that just could describe an x, uh, if you go through the mathematics, would be a spiral. In fact, maybe a double helix. And so the double helix came out of, out of uh, equipment, something like this. Now, fast forward to today, and you end up with uh, something what's called the world's first hard X-ray free electron laser. So what is a hard X-ray? That's a very, very short, very, very energetic X-ray. Very, The ones that aren't so energetic are called soft X-rays. <laughs> and uh, the ones in the middle that aren't hard and aren't soft, they call tender. <laughs> So that's their terminology. So at Slack, they keep updating this X-ray laser. And you can see this is September of 23. So this is quite recent. They have upped the game. They have their phase two. And they can do these femtosecond pulses at 8,000 times faster than before. So they can do a million X-ray flashes per second. And that allows them to take movies. These short, it's almost like a stroboscopic effect. They can put molecules that are actually going through bonding or replication or doing other things, and they can actually take movies of these molecules and try to figure out exactly what's going on. It's quite interesting. All right, and while I was there, I saw junk. I saw piles of junk. I don't know where their junk goes, but I want it. Uh, so yeah, here's... Here's some things, and then there's this box full of things, and it's like, ah, oh, 
where does this stuff go? How do I, how do I get a hold of this stuff? Anyway, hope you enjoyed the tour of the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. <laughs>